Hi, Terry. <laughs> So, how many of you were here last year and saw me rattle on about GCs? Okay, so the first 30 slides in that presentation, sorry, um, I'm going to go pretty fast through those. I'm going to try. Yesterday I said what I was going to do and I didn't do it at all. So I'm going to try to go pretty quick through that stuff. Um, how many of you run a GC? Okay, how many of you are going to run a GC? That's okay, so that's why I'm going through them pretty quick. So those couple of you that have specific GC questions, where do I buy it, is it really a pain, all that stuff, please ask me about it afterwards. And what I'd like to do is at the, end of, at the end of the presentation, what I want you to get out of this is not so much about the machine and what that looks like and all that fun stuff. It's more what are we learning about transesterification by looking at those nice pictures the GC makes, okay? So those of you who sat through last year, hopefully this year, I'll get a little, you know, share with you a little bit more about what I think I've learned and what you guys have helped me learn. Because a lot of you, you know, Terry, Graydon, Lawrence, Larry, whose other samples have I tested in here? You know, John. I've got some of the hemp fuel from last year that you and uh, and Mark gave me. John, I've got your palm fuel for the 327 test. So we're going to look at chromatograms. Then we're going to squirt it into some 27.3. Um, actually, there are nine ones because I've got those little tubes that we'll be able to see that. So, to talk more about what's really happening in the reaction in terms of monitors, dyes, and trucks. And without further ado, you can hit the lights. With this funny black background thing. Turn this puppy over. Okay. I know. John, that was just too cool. You plugged it in, it was like the, the code key. Um, so, yeah, it's my favorite, so I put it in every presentation I do. Um, I'm probably walking out of the end. So we'll skip it, but this is a uh, triglyceride. Here's the glycerin. Here's the fatty acid chain. Here's the end on view. It's coming at you. This is what glycerin looks like. Yeah, if it does break, you just got to move. Dive out of the way. Why is glycerin bad? Well, what DOE says is free and total glycerin numbers, well, you measure the amount of unconverted or partially converted fats and byproduct glycerin in the fuel. So again, when we look at that big molecule, what we're doing with the GC is we are measuring, so this is a try. You guys see my hand, I got three fingers held up. When we knock one off, it's now a diglyceride. This is a monoglyceride, okay? This is free glycerin, that backbone molecule, okay? And so what we're measuring with the GC is the weight of the glycerin either free, meaning I'm free, I've got no free fatty acids connected, or bound to a free fatty acid chain. So bound glycerin mono has part of the weight of it, 0.2591% of the weight of a mono is the glycerin. So that's what we're measuring. A dye is like 0.15% because you got more weight on this arm, right? So the GC, when you see those results, that spec is 0.240 total glycerin. It's how much is free, the stuff you guys wash out, because okay, it's real water soluble. And what is bound, meaning it's a mono, a dye, or a tri. Tries are unreacted oil. Okay? Incomplete conversion leads to high total glycerin. Because again, you've got monos, dyes, and tries if you have not converted them. Incomplete removal of the glycerin leads to high free glycerin total. That's kind of a no brainer. If the numbers are too high, storage tank, fuel system, and engine fouling can occur. So they worry about things like. Um, what is it, uh, shellacking, um, this sort of thing on injectors. What did you say? <laughs> Lacquering. <laughs> I've been dying to do that. I told you last night. <laughs> uh, Lacquering, yes, exactly. Where that glycerin burns on the inside of the, the fuel injection equipment and it makes the lacquer, right? Fuels that exceed the limits are highly likely to cause filter plugging and other problems, says DOE. I say bullshit, okay? <laughs> And I say bullshit because how many of you, you got people running SBO in here? Okay, how many miles, Sasha, probably? Uh, on this trip, 15,000. On your equipment? On the equipment, 200 something. Okay, how many injectors have you changed? Uh, one, but it cracks, it's really, really old. Right, so thanks, Sasha. Um, you know, the bottom line is I've talked to lots of people, so have you, have run SBO, totally unconverted, right? Without problems. So again, what kind of equipment, sorry? Uh, it's a uh, Mercedes. Nice. What year? 82. Okay, this is important. It's not an 06 TDI. 
Okay? There are people that are running straight vegetable oil and O6TDIs. I wish them good luck. I hope it works out for them. And it may well. I mean, really. We don't know yet. Jury's out. But when a guy like Sasha can say 200,000 miles on his Mercedes, which, by the way, if anybody's looking for one, remember, Larry's got a couple of nice ones for sale. <laughs> I told you, every presentation I'll tell you. Um, so, go ahead. None. Zero. <laughs> Zero. I just, you know, but it's connecting people. It's recycling old Mercedes. How cool is that? Okay. So how do we get glycerin out? Well, one is we convert it. Okay. The second is we wash it. So the homebrew samples that I've tested, and I've tested about 40 of them, roughly, from, from you guys and gals, okay? I don't remember one that failed for free glycerin, because washing works, okay? And when you, when you look at how much gets washed out on first wash, almost all your methanol, almost all your glycerin comes out with your first wash, because then what you're doing is working on soaps, right? So, not typically a problem for people, but for those of you, anybody make biodiesel and do, doesn't wash it and runs it in their equipment? Okay. Um, how many miles? I've got seven vehicles, three and a half years. Do you do the gram laying kind of method where you let it sit and let all the alcohol go out and then let the soap drop? Yeah. Okay. So if you guys missed a little nuance of what I just said, what he's doing is he's letting the fuel sit. The methanol is what allows the soap to remain suspended in the fuel, okay? So if you've got the time, and I, you know, as a commercial producer, I want to do that. I don't want to have to get rid of iron exchange beads, suspend. I don't want to get rid of wash water. Uh, I don't really want to put the methanol in the air either. I want to do it with evapor or with uh, distillation, but but if, you put, if you're not doing what this gentleman's doing, and you're putting unwashed fuel that you haven't let sit and, and to make sure you've got the methanol, and particularly the, the soaps out, you know, uh, it's probably not a good idea. How much time typically do you uh, let it sit then? How much time you let, how long do you let that sit, roughly? It depends on like fuel needs. Sometimes it'll be three, four days, sometimes it'll be two weeks. Exactly, it's not short. So go online, the infopop forum, biodiesel.infopop.cc or infopop.biodiesel.cc. Biodiesel.infopop.cc. Thank you, Graydon. It's Graham Laming. I, you know, what a hero. <laughs> That's all I can say. Um, so the spec, uh, E1 is actually not the latest, it's now A, uh, but I didn't want to spend another 32 bucks. So, free glycerin, 0.02% mass or less. That's not much, is it? 0.02, two one hundredths of 1%. Okay? Um, total glycerin, 0 0.240, one quarter of 1% mass is allowed to be monodized tries. That's nothing, okay? And so as we look at the 327 test, and I, you know, there's some great discussion back and forth, again on the info pop forum, particularly about the 273 test, and Andrew Morris, who was here last year, has really done a lot of great work with that. Um, and I like the way he's going forward with it, because people are trying to read all kinds of stuff in the 273. You know, if I chill it down, if I put it like three times as much and it's still clear, is that cool? Is that like three times better? You know, we're measuring such small amounts now of glycerin that, you know, the 327 test, we'll look at it here afterwards, is a go-no-go -no -go gauge. You know, if you're under half a percent, yeah, lose no sleep. If you're after under 0.8 percent, still lose no sleep. Uh, I'm not even that. That's my baby. It's in a box in Bakersfield, and I'm really sad. When we closed down Rocky Mountain Biodiesel, I put it in a box. I sent it to Bakersfield. It was supposed to get out and see the light of day, and it's not. So uh, the one I'm using now is Shimazu, which is a uh, like buying a piece of sour. Um, you couldn't do, right? Um, it's a big oven, okay? So this is an HP Series 2. Um, it's bomb proof. Um, if I was little and there was a tornado, I would climb inside it. Okay? <laughs> so you go change columns, you mess around with this thing, even a guy with all thumbs like me uh, could figure this out. We bought it for 13 grand from a recycled um, equipment company right here in Golden, Colorado. Uh, what it does is it measures precisely the percent mass of free glycerin, again, the backbone, monos, one carbon, hydrocarbon chain, dyes and tries in a sample of metal esters. Okay? Basically, it's a big, it's an oven. So inside here, these are thin glass columns. There's a 12 meter column and a five, three, a short one and a longer one. 
<laughs> uh, this is, these are glass. These happen to be aluminum clad. And this thing's an oven. And it sends it through a temperature ring. So what you're doing is you're injecting a sample up on top that you mix with some nasty chemicals to help spread things out a bit, okay? And you inject that into the column. You've got some gas that's pushing the material through the column. As it goes up the temperature ramp, different materials will, come, will boil off and elute, that's a fun GC word, at different times, okay? And as they come out the back side here, they go through a flame ionization detector. We got this came from Wikipedia, okay? So if you want to go see it yourself, go see. What the flame ionization detector does is the gases come through, there's a little flame, it burns the material as it comes out in a magical chemistry sort of way. Um, these create ions. It's actually create, uh, measuring the difference in potential between the voltage here and the voltage at the collector, and it creates a peak. Okay, so if you inject heptane onto the column or methanol onto the column, the column's flat, you inject it in, it goes back down again, flat line, okay? So when you put a sample of biodiesel in, there's all kinds of stuff in there. And it makes all these funny curves, and that's uh, the fun that uh, Rachel gets to have on a daily basis, figuring out which one is which. The test method is D6584. It prescribes a method, as Rachel said, for the setup, the sample prep, and the analysis of chromatograms. Um, I'm not going to read through this because that's the boring stuff. Yeah, we call it Mustafa. <laughs> and that's what that's how I say it. <laughs> um, the uh, maintenance and repair, basically, calibration, this is a big thing. So you just spent 13 grand on a used piece of equipment to measure 0.240% of something. If you don't calibrate it, you know, don't have it. Right? Do the 27.3 test. And, and that's what you guys should do. You should probably also occasionally send something out for third-party testing. You know? To uh, Greg, has got a good, good uh, source of that now, and, and uh, I'll show you the gel slide. But you know, people, any sort of equipment you get, okay, if you don't keep it calibrated, it's a boating, all right. And one way to keep it calibrated, as Rachel said, is do cross checks with people, okay. So if you guys are measuring water and oil, you Austin fellows, right? Um, send me a sample. I can measure water and oil too with a little two hundred and some odd dollar kit I got from Graydon. It's very precise, okay. Because that way we can see if, you know, hey, I got 1%, you got half a percent, or I got 1%, you got 20%, or whatever. We can figure it out. It's really important to cross-check with your friends. Um, retention time, and I'm going to talk about this. I guess I'll just show the chromatograms. But this is how long a particular compound material takes to come off the column and make its own special little heat. Repair. <sighs> you know, things are great with GCs until they're not. It's kind of like net home networking on your PC. You know, you fiddle for it around with that, it doesn't work and you can't see it. It's like, look, the other computer's right here. It's right here, you can't see it, you can't see it, and then all of a sudden you go into properties and then it works. You know, what? I was just in properties, right? Does this happen to anybody? But yeah, <laughs> GCs are the same way. It's like, it, everything's going great, it went for months, and then off the edge of the earth. It's like, oh, say, you go through and you replace septas on the front end, you make sure you trim your column, you do all the things that make sense and it's not working and you come back later after lunch and try and it's perfect. So they're, they're temperamental. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. Because <laughs> um, you're using an analog machine where you're cooking something and making a flame go up and turning it into this little tiny electrical signal, right? It's, um, I've got a whole new appreciation for it and a lot less hair. Um, how many equipment and supplies you need? Um, all analytical balance at 1500 bucks used. Um, a pipetter, got one over there uh, that I got, somebody gave me, but they're typically 250 bucks. It's expensive, right? Um, you can do have a, have a lot of third party tests done by people who have all the equipment to do this for a lot less money than you can own your own equipment, okay? So, unless somebody in this room is going to be a commercial producer or wants to do their own lab and make their own lab, just you know, buying flash testers and GCs and stuff is madness. How much did you spend total on the lab, roughly? Um, oh, 200K? No. 100K? No. 80K? Somewhere between 60 and 80. Okay, for $60,000 to $80,000, how many tests could you get done with that out of house rating? Bunches, right? Tons. Tons, tons. 20 years worth. You run the whole ASDM, you see it's done. More, all right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, it's expensive. Uh, you have pit gases you're dealing with. So $50 to $70 per tank. It'll last one to four months, depending on the gas that you're using. And if you remember to turn off, 
uh, chemical standards, um, the calibration standard, you get it at 300 bucks. So you break the column, you've got to replace the column, you, you, you calibrate, bam, 300 bucks, 300 bucks per column, okay? It's, uh, it's not for the faint at walls. So many considered for patients, well, you know, we had a nice desk and it was actually used from shop code from their offices. Dedicated power circuit, small fridge, fire cabinets, proper the gas bottles, and these guys in gold, if you're looking for lab stuff, um, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Yes. Do you have to get fire uh, approval for your lab? Uh, for many months? Uh, yes. So the reason I'm hes I hesitated was we didn't have to go for a formal special permit for the lab, but the fire guy absolutely walks through and says, okay, I see you got your bottles chained up, and I, think I see you got your hydrogen out here, and, and so yes. But there isn't a specific... Uh, is it part of the whole plant package or is it? It's part of the whole plant package. Okay. So your fire and building code um, inspection and walkthrough is going to handle that. When you put in the lab stuff afterwards, yes. let your conscience be your guide. Okay? But get caught and pay fines. Okay. So the best thing, and again, if anything, you know, the more that you're above board, the more you walk in the front door of the fire protection district when I was up in Perth, and say, hi, I'm Bob, and I'm making my diesel over here on Site Street. Would you like to come by? And they said, yeah, you know, Bob, we will. Okay? Whether you did or didn't, at least he's feeling welcome. And I told him, anytime you want to come in, anytime you have an issue, come on in. Um, the more transparency, and great, you know, you've done this on the scale you're doing it. You pay some prices, but you sleep better at night. Right? No surprises. Oh, no, so, it's yeah, it's absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, go ahead. Purity is what these these solvent or these calibration compounds are, are, are steeped in, and it's it is it is toxic, carcinogenic, bad, bad. It makes methanol look like Kool Aid. Okay. Um, so again, with that in mind, let's go and show people Bob doing the lab without gloves on. Okay. <laughs> these are my invisible gloves. Okay. These are my invisible gloves. Here I'm taking a sample of biodiesel with a micro pipetter. Actually, it's not really my arm. It looks like it. Um, uh, you know, we've got heptane in a little bottle over here. I try to keep the lab clean. Mine's not quite as clean as Rachel's is. Um, any of you that get a chance to make a pilgrimage to Piedmont, I would do it. They have days set up. What day do you guys do tours? First Friday of every month and every Sunday at the pool. And you guys are, are, are open source. Can I say those words about you? So any question you ask them, could I take a picture of your reactor? And I have. It's just, you know, guys, all I can say is if you're near north, central, North Carolina, kind of where you are, okay? The Piedmont. The Piedmont, um, and, and very cool people. Um, and you know what you're doing? Okay. Uh, all kinds of size glassware, so here's a sample. So in this 15 ml vial, here's, you know, this is biodiesel in the bottom here, okay, seven drops. Um, in there also is the, uh, the uh, silating agent, which is the uh, MSCFA. Set it again. <laughs> Um, and uh, internal standards. Um, here I'm putting in the seven, uh, seven drops of biodiesel. Here I'm putting in the internal standards with my invisible gloves. Um, lab fridge. If you store things, nasty stuff like this, do not put food in this fridge. Okay, just a bad idea. In fact, don't eat your lab. Okay, um, at, you know. So last or night, your lab. or drink in your lab. Last night. Paul, thank you for the methanol. Brought me some methanol in a Coke bottle that was clear. You know, if it was a water bottle and I set it down next to yours, you're dead. Well, maybe not, but 30 to 100 mLs kills you. Okay. Um, so the first thing I did when I got that from me, Paul, was took my pen and started writing all over it. So because Lawrence wanted to drink it, um, but just don't put stuff in the lab because biodiesel looks like apple juice, right? <laughs> Bad stuff. Um, Bob uh, driving the GC, auto sampler. Uh, this was set up for 100 samples. The most I ever did was five. If I stacked up more than five, guaranteed that to run sequentially, the column would break or something would happen. So, you know, I just went, you know, I'm not stacking up more than five again. Um, okay, good stuff. Good stuff. So, this slide should be later in the presentation. But I'll talk about a couple of things here. 
So along the bottom here on the x-axis, we have minutes 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes. Up the y-axis, we have signal, which this one actually says counts. This is counting the this is measuring the electronic signal off of the flame ionization detector. So we start at time zero. This is our heptane peak that we use as a solvent. So it goes, you know, cooking along, cooking along. Bam! <coughs> After the FID comes heptane, because heptane's light, it uh, you lose quickly. Bam! Thousands of cats, the peak somewhere up there by, I don't know, um, Lookout Mountain. Comes back down, and we come back to our baseline, we cook along, and basically we hit where glycerin would be, but you know, this is a watch biodiesel, so there isn't. Here's an internal standard, you can try all, okay? So we put in two internal standards, this one and tricaprin, and what that lets us do is, we measure the glycerin peak against it, okay? And so, you've told it in a calibration table, if I get on the way, and I, you know, the numbers aren't so important, you've told it the relationship between glycerin and the standard. So every time you see this much standard, okay, that equates to this much glycerin. It says, okay, so now I see this much standard, that must be this much glycerin, right? And it's able to uh, do a, um, what's the right word, it's relative, um, amounts of, the, of that material. So when you set up the machine, you're feeding it a known standard of glycerin, you're feeding it five different levels, okay? This is five to the minus three percent mass, 1.5 to minus two, so you're giving it increasing amounts, and then you're telling it, uh, you're actually writing the machine, and it's 40 samples, that's not this run, this is not the calibration <laughs> run, and it creates a relationship of area between the standard and the material. So butane trial is the standard that's used for glycerin, and tricaprin is used for monos, dyes, and tries. And so we get a calibration curve over here that we're looking for three dimes, basically, a correlation of 999 something. <coughs> this one might be 998 something. Uh, sorry. So we're setting up the machine. The other thing, for any of you who go to calibrate a machine, there's something in the standard called approximate relative retention time. That's like two fight words in a row, isn't it? It's approximately, relatively, sort of like this, okay? And so it's telling you, in glycerin, for example, if, if butane trial comes off at four minutes, look for glycerin at 85% of four minutes in terms of retention time. That makes sense? Okay? What I found, and I don't know, Rachel, you know, it's crap. Hooey. Hooey. Because everybody's GC is different. Your glass flow is different, and although you've set it all up to the method, you're not going to hit these numbers. Um, this is calculating results. So I talked a little bit about the beginning, and these are some of those fun formulas. This one looks hard, but it really isn't. Um, this is saying that in a mono, the percent mass of glycerin is uh, taking the amount of the mono times 0 .25, uh, 2591 to get just the glycerin piece. In a dye, it's 0 0.1488, like that, okay? And so, you know, you create a little spreadsheet where basically you put in the sample number, uh, you put in the sample that it was, the name of it, and these are numbers coming off the machine, and we take them, for example, the monos, which are monopolitans, and uh, the other monos, mono uh, olein and mono, and mono linoleum, something like that. Linoleum, I don't know, I can't say them. Um, and you add them together, and I'm factoring them down here by that 0.2591%, okay? So these are bound, these now are representing the weight of the bound glycerin in this sample, okay? So I've got 0.1% mass of glycerin in the form of a mono, okay? But it's only the weight of the glycerin. I've got 0.068 of dyes and 0.086 hardly any drops. So my total bound as of now, I have 0.1232, that's about half the spec, okay? My free was 0008, the spec is 0.02. So I'm washed, right? And we get a total glycerin. So ASDM specs, and somebody correctly pointed out last year that this is not really true. There is no spe ASDM spec for bound. They have spec there's a spec for free at 0.02 and total at 0.24. Okay. So Sapelco, so the people who sell us our chemicals, uh, have this handy chromatogram, which actually has some errors in it. That, uh, but, but not big ones, but what it's showing again is the heptane peak, here's glycerin and butane triol. These are your methyl esters, okay? These are different carbon chain lengths. So we're gonna have you know, C16, C18, C19, 
like that, okay? And here's our monopolitans. This is what they were wrong about. This actually is the monopolitan peak here. And I got a free, uh, did you get your free monos kit? I got a free monos kit. I think it's because I pointed this out at the end of the show. Um, I got a free something else. Okay. Um, this is monos. Okay, so this is again monoolein, monolinolein, and monosterin. Um, Tricapra, these are diglycerides. And these are triglycerides. Unreactive oil, diglycerides, monoglycerides, free glycerin. Does that kind of make sense? Because the fun part's coming up. So in the standard, the ASTM standard, which if you reproduce the ASTM standard, they take you to jail. So you put one in a presentation like this, and you know, I hope I look good in orange. Um, and then you give it to Graydon and he puts it on the website. But you know what? So far, I'm walking free. <laughs> um, this is showing the same thing. Okay, so again, it's got a heptane peak, here's our glycerol, these are giving retention time in minutes, okay, here's our esters, here's our monos, the monopolitans, and the monoglycerides, here's our dyes, and our trucks. okay? So now we get into the fun stuff. So this is a sample I ran that had free glycerin, and I've actually got the sample here today. This was fuel made from waste vegetable oil, you know, that stuff that we've been told you can't make spec fuel out of, okay? Um, and you can see that there's no, no uh, free glycerin here. Here's the internal standard. Here's our esters, our monopalmatins, our monos. This is our internal standard number two. Here's our dyes, these little peaks hanging off on the side of this one. And virtually no tribes, okay? This came in at 0 0.1241, about half the spec, okay? When I sent this off to Magellan, okay, they measured the sample at, I think it was 0 0.1208. That's called better to be lucky than good. <laughs> uh, that's a, uh, you know, when that first happened, I was jazzed. I was like, wow. Just kind of like you were saying, oh, it's the corollary. It's like, wow, I can't believe I'm that close. Um, but what I found, in, in, with, and I think, Rachel, what you found in others is that if you're fairly attentive to method, you can reproduce what Deanna does, right? Um, so this is good fuel. That's the good. This is the bad, okay? So holy cow, this, uh, this fuel is also waste vegetable oil based. Waste vegetable oil based tends to have this fun hump gram out here. Um, but these are tries, okay? We call them orca fins for obvious reasons. Here's dyes, oh my god, right? <coughs> it's visually very different, right? Here's dyes, a fuel at 0.12. This 0.48, that's only double the spec, we're talking less than half a percent of bound glycerin. This is really good homebrew, by the way, okay? Not as good as Graydon's and Larry's and Lawrence and John's, okay? But it's, it's better than a lot of what I saw, okay? Um, but the point is, is that you don't need to understand correlation, you don't need, need to understand anything much more than you can see now to go, this is obvious that these represent unreacted oil, okay? This represents partially reacted oil, because you only whack one of the three off. Okay, our monos, again, high, um, and in this case, here's the glycerin. So see the total glycerin of 0 0.92, okay? And this is unwashed fuel, okay? And so when I got that sample, um, you know, it was obvious. Uh, this is uh, bad, and then, <clears throat> the ugly. <laughs> this fuel was made in a fuel meister, just a statement of fact, okay? You can make good fuel in a fuel meister, I have no doubt. It's not about the equipment. You can make good fuel just like this. Who made this, by the way? No, I just. <laughs> okay, so it's really fuel meisters, and again, I don't, I'm not going to go off on this thing about polytanks and fires and all that, because, you know, read about it, talk to Graydon, he'll tell you. <laughs> Most of you. But the guy who made this fuel um, is here in the Denver area, I think, Lawrence. I got this sample from you. Yeah. But you did not make it. No. Put it in his truck. How does his truck like this fuel, Lawrence? Um, I think he was on the second. Okay. Literally, this stuff looked like orange juice. I've got a sample of it here. We're going to put it in the 327 test, and it's going to verify what we see here, which is great gobs of triglycerides, okay? Mountainous guys and a fair amount of monos. What's interesting, and we're going to see then hopefully the rest of this presentation is this is almost, if you want unreacted oil, it doesn't look substantially different than this, okay? So, see how the esters are, are less? Can you guys see that? I mean, there's less esters here. These peaks are narrower and shorter. 
because all the shit's still over here. <laughs> okay? So what happens when we're transistor fine is, in this example is we're basically taking this stuff and pushing it that way. Okay? So we're taking the tries, we're making the dies for a moment, we're taking the dies, we're making the monas, we're taking the monas, we're making the messages. That makes sense? Okay? So the 327 test is a guy named Rick in Rick. I don't know Rick's last name off the top of my head. Oh. In, thank you. Um, who he and I, I talked to him on the phone. I've not met, had the pleasure of meeting him in person. We tried to get him here, huh? Yeah. And uh, he, busy guy. Um, he and I shoot on this quite a bit. He's a sharp fellow. A lot of you folks are as well. And and so what he had me do was he had me take we, to figure out what is the 327 test really doing? Who's done that test, by the way, here? Okay. Um, who's homebrewing and not doing that test? Okay. So you won't be able to raise your hand in a little bit because you got your fuel here and we'll do it. It's such an easy test. It makes a bunch of sense. And here's why we think it works. Okay. So what Rick had me do was do the test, see what falls out. Okay. We're going to see some pictures of it in a second. I throw it on the GC and see what you got. That's why Rick's a smart guy, right? So what is the precipitate? Okay. Well, it was mostly tries. And there were some dyes and some monos and some esters and you know probably other stuff, probably some of my hair, I don't know. But it was mostly dye. Uh, I'm sorry, tribes. Because triglycerides and methanol don't mix, do they? How many of you, you pour methanol on when you're making, doing your reaction, you pour the methanol in, it'll sit on top, right? Until you shake it, or mix it, or pump it. Okay? They're not miscible. Okay? Because triglycerides aren't terribly polar, but methanol is. So dyes. Monos are pretty miscible, or will dissolve in methanol, okay? And monos will, to some extent. So they'll stay up in the methanol in the 327 test in a way that the tries won't. So when you put a sample of biodiesel into methanol, kill it till it's dead, John. Um, <laughs> what we're seeing is, so the other thing Rick had me. So, <laughs> so the other thing Rick had me do was he said, so now run the stuff in the top of the test tube on your 327 test, the methanol phase, and see what's in that. And guess what I didn't find much of? Correct. There was some, because they were floating around in there, okay, but not much. So what we're, why that test works, in his opinion, I'm going to play it on him now, in my opinion as well, obviously, is what we're seeing is unreacted oil, okay? And why that works is that as we take this unreacted oil generally, which is what this fuelmeister made, or it didn't make, I guess, with biodiesel, as we knock off, knock this molecule apart, okay, pretend that somebody in the back of the room had a, had a, sh uh, a rifle that was going to blow my fingers off, right? Your chances of hitting, you know, a finger isn't very good. And that's kind of the chance of methanol hitting the end of a, of a free fatty acid because methanol is a small molecule. But the chances are you're going to knock off one. Let's say you had a shotgun, okay, a pretty big shot. You might knock off one or two, but the chances are you're not going to knock off all three up off of a bunch of these at the same time, okay? You're just not. And so what happens is, is that we're pushing the reaction this way, okay? And if you have pushed the reaction to get close to ASTM spec conversion, by definition, you will not have triglycerides, okay? Because in order to get most of the glycerin out, these will have to be already all gone. I mean, what's the chances again if we had all these, you know, guys holding up fingers down here shooting at them with, that's just a nasty picture. Um, <laughs> um, the chances are that if you don't have a good, good reaction kinetics and you're not, not getting good uh, transesterification, you're going to have a bunch of these left with fingers on them, okay? And so you'll never be near spec. That's why 327 appears to work. Is that sort of clear? Okay. Um, so this one's kind of fun. This is, I'm kind of hard to see. This is actually three chromatograms overlaid, saying what I've just sort of showed you. So the blue line here is not very good fuel. Okay, see the tries? The green line is better fuel. And the red line, which you really can't quite see because it's down here, okay, is in spec. Um, and so again, as we, this kind of analysis really helps us check our recipe, right? So we can, Hold the cost and constant, vary the methanol. Hey, let's do that. Let's stay at the same grams per liter, but let's go down to 
instead of 22%, which we like to use, let's go to 20, let's go to 18, let's use 24, let's use 30, and see what our conversion does, okay? Let's hold the methanol constant and change the constant, which is, you know, what we do, of course, as we're changing um, feedstocks uh, of different FFA levels, particularly. Um, let's keep both those things constant and mix it for half an hour. Let's mix it for an hour. Let's mix it for overnight, right? Uh, it's just fun. And that's really the fun that I've realized with having a GC is that you can, you can isolate variables in your process okay, and see how they affect conversion. I can tell you that what works for me in my equipment won't work for you in your equipment in anywhere near the same way. So my friend Larry back here who made the best homebrew brew fuel still that I've tested, 0.09. That, that glycerin, okay? Um, you use very low grams per liter. You use something like eight grams per liter of that, okay? Um, and I don't get those results. I need to use a lot more than that. And, and that oil titrated at two point something. I looked at it this morning. <laughs> I hope you don't think I keep your numbers in my head. Um, but uh, I can't get that level of conversion with that low of grams of cost. It couldn't when I worked at the plant in Hawaii. Not me, but we couldn't. We couldn't invert this. We can't condense it. So, you're doing a single stage based reaction with KOH. Oh, Two sodium. of sodium. And was it, uh, was it sodium then? Yeah. Single stage? Yeah. Okay. Couldn't, we couldn't do it with sodium either. <laughs> so, what I think is his mixing is very different than mine. Okay? If I take the same ingredients and put them together in the same way, I should get the same sort of stuff, right? And I don't. Okay? So, my point of this little diversion is your recipe you need to tweak for you. Your equipment, your mixing, your temperatures, your methanol supply, your feedstock, right? Because it will be slightly different. So if somebody says, oh, I got the perfect recipe and I got it from, from Larry, um, it may be a very, very good recipe. I know it's really good for Larry in his process and his mixing. Uh, Rachel alluded to the cross-check program that ASTM does. They send a stamp, sample around the country, and same stuff, okay? So we give the same sample to 40 labs. And these are people, generally they're uh, research institutions. It's Magellan, um, you know, uh, National Test Lab. It's Intertech Kilo Brett, another National Test Lab. And so each one of these points represents for total glycerin on the samples they sent around in June of 04, so we measured it and we came up at 0.17 something for that sample. So this isn't fuel I made, this is, they sent it to us, about 550 or 650 bucks a year to be in the program. And we measured it. Sent the results back, and about two months later they sent me this packet. You open it up like your final grades, how do we do, how do we do? And we went, woo! Okay, again, better to be lucky than good. So here's standard deviations. Um, this would be uh, one uh, this is three standards, yeah. okay? Um, so three standard deviations off the mean. They threw anything over that out, and there were some from the national level labs. This is Bob and Steve's biodiesel company, two of us, okay? So this is where if, what it showed me is that any of us, if I can make fuel, my buddy Steve who, who made fuel with me can make fuel, and we can test fuel, it's not that mysterious, right? It just isn't, right? Question. Uh, I just want to clarify, when you say it's better to be lucky and good, are you trying to be modest? Or yes. <laughs> yes. But I do believe it. No, I don't believe it. I'm trying to be modest. I don't want people to think that you're, oh, well, I But all I can say is, I wouldn't have known a GC if it landed on my head a year ago in November. Okay? Um, we bought the GC in November of 05. So when I came here in July of 06, we had the machine. That's about when you started making fuel, wasn't it? November of 05? Maybe. Yeah, I think it was. So I've been. Have playing with the GC as long as Frank, you've been messing with fuel. Um, have you learned a lot in the last year? Yes. Yeah, me too. Okay. But the point is, after only seven months, we're correlating well with national labs on this piece of equipment that seems pretty, pretty tricky. So this made me feel good for being an old guy. Old dogs can learn some new tricks. Um, in terms of interpreting all these damn peaks, what I can say is this. When you look at them day in, day out, day in, day out, there are differences in feedstocks. Again, particularly in terms of your carbon chains, you're going to see different, different amounts. This one was very high in, in whatever carbon chain this was in the last year. Different, um, but they become very, very, very similar. 
Um, and so but initially trying to figure out which peak on our chromatogram was monosomatens was tricky. This came from Magellan, so I ran a sample on the machine, on our machine. I sent it to Magellan. Deanna Angst Highland, one of my heroines, sent me back this, and it was the Rosetta Stone. Because this is basically zooming in on glycerin, monos, so here's monopolitan, right? And this is, so it's basically zooming in on this feature right here. Right, right here. And it let me then, it, it, so it's very easy, again, if you're going to spend that amount of money on a machine or any piece of test equipment, do a cross check. So you know that what you're getting are valid results. So here's a uh, third party testing. This quote from Magellan was March 24th of last year, so it's a little over a year old. Prices haven't changed much. These prices are a little bit higher, I think, Graydon, than the lab you've been working with. Um, and uh, you know, so it's 89 bucks for a free total glycerin test. Don't go run out and buy a GC, unless you really want to beat your head against something. Um, but if you want to know, um, you know, send it off to Magellan. So, you know, get, go look on Graydon's site, and, and I think you save 10 bucks. I think it's 79 bucks, isn't it? <laughs> so, sulfur, 60 bucks. You know, uh, water and sediment, 67 bucks. Distillation, one that's meaningless, 350 bucks. So don't do that one, right? But if you're interested in doing so, it's not that hard. Um, you can pay to do it. So, now we're going to get some more chromatograms, because not everyone's asleep yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Chemistry at 8 in the morning. I, I told you guys, you've heard me say it numerous times, I flunked chemistry twice in college, both times it was at 8 a.m. What was I thinking? Freshman year, what was I thinking? So when Graydon, whoever, John, put me on at 8 in the morning, thanks. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't you drink, didn't, I didn't want to get to drink as much as, as I wanted to last night. Um, we so, figured people would show up on time if we put you at 8 in the morning. <laughs> there you go. Um, this is refined bleach and deodorized palm. Okay, this is orangutan and other stuff. I got this from a guy named Tiger. Um, hey, Tiger, man, I have some of this stuff. <laughs> Seriously, he was at the show in uh, the MVB big conference in San Antonio this year. He had those. Were some of you there? I know, I, I know some of you were there because I saw, saw you. He had this stuff in. It was solidified room temperature. Okay, so I'll transistor by anything. Okay, any of you work at light reception clinic though? That's because you know why not, right? Um, we've got a bunch of them. Um, so what you can see here is this has a total. So I took this back. I, I basically transesterified in the lab a glorified Dr. Pepper technique. You know we use um, uh, canning jars, kind of canning jars. You know, the kind of when you start shaking up the methanol, it starts coming through the seal that's designed to let the pressure out and run it down the sides. We use those. <laughs> Don't ask me why. I think it's because they run through the dishwasher nicely. Okay? Um, but, uh, so make this fuel total down, 0.09. <whistles> okay? I don't think it's 20 grams per liter. It's probably 12 of KOH. It's titrated at 0.4. Okay? So it's 12 of KOH. Is that really what he said? Yeah. It really is. Um, this is the exact right? Yeah, this was. I'm getting, I don't know if it's virgin or not because I learned last night for the first time what that really means, right? That it wasn't heated. Yeah. Um, thanks, Sam. Um, but uh, this was palm, refined, bleached, and deodorized. So it had not been cooked or had anything done with it. Um, and again, if you look at the chromatogram, you can see one that this was a mini batch unwashed because see the glycerin. Okay? And the, the three was, uh, I guess they did wash it once, not well enough. So it's in spec. Uh, but typically in production, we don't see that kind of people. And I'll bet you don't either, which is that we ship. When you ship, you don't see a glycerin peak, right? It's come out. So this was lab washed, which means you're going to have to wash the top of it. But again, you can see that the dyes are low, the tries are non existent, 0.0091. And this is a typical profile. If we look at how much of the, of the glycerin is left and where it is, most of it's in monos. Um, you know, a, a 0 0.09, 0 0.07 and a half is there. I don't know what that is, 80% or something, 90%, and it's very, very typical, because again, you've whacked all those guys to nothing, you've got these almost eliminated, and, and when you do this, you can get fuel that actually the monitors are still quite high, and then you've whacked enough of those into esters that you get 0.09. Um, this stuff, uh, I have the sample still on my desk in, in Denton, and on cooler days inside, it will start to cloud, something like 65 or, or, or like that. Um, this is 
this, oh, I put this one in. This is from Illinois State, a guy I met in at the Sustainable Summit this uh, February, which is a much better conference, by the way, than the MVP conference. Just way, way, okay? Much better. Because the MVP conference, everybody was selling something, pump guys, great tank killing palm oil guys and gals. And you know, it's just, and most of them hadn't actually done it. You know, they, so I talked to the Roper guys because you know Roper comps and me I did as well. Um, and you know they're looking for feedback from people like us saying you know so it doesn't work and the seals go bad you know. And so, but the sustainable conference, you know, it was Frankie, it was Steve, it was his people are doing it, collecting oil, making fuel. So wherever that conference and nice job. Is it going to be in Florida this year? What part roughly? Um, it may or may not be in Orlando. Okay, Rachel organized. Yeah, she did a very nice job. She and Sarah Hope and Emily and yeah, it was just it was a fabulous event. It was only one day. Sustainable Biodiesel Summit. And yeah, you know, if it could be more than one day, that would be good. <laughs> really? Okay, um, so these guys at Illinois State, they made this without caustic. They made this with enzymes. Yeah, that's what I said. So they were having problems. He came up to me after my presentation and said, did you have problems calibrating the machine in the shop? So I went, yeah, somewhat. So I've worked with them over the last few months, um, taught them how to condition columns, Rachel. <laughs> and just last week, I got an email from Guan Jin, his uh, research assistant, and they are successfully now running a, a cross-checking well. But uh, this is pretty exciting because, not so much because of what this chromatogram looks like, but because of what it represents. Okay, so this is a process that we don't have yet. I don't even know exactly what it means. But <coughs> they did this in the presence of water. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. It's pretty cool stuff. Nice. So they're teaching them to make to transistor up. I want to look at the ecology of those bats. You got a really high FFA bat. Steve had 2,000 gallons of it. <laughs> but yeah, it's cool stuff. So this is Illinois State, a guy named uh, Tom Birma. Uh, cool stuff. Uh, this one is a sample of Homer's fuel. This one came in at 1.82. And again, we can kind of see that, right? So you guys are now junior chromatographers, right? So if I ask you, does this mean spec? Should be. No. Okay. Your voice got match. <laughs> exactly. Come on, GC badge. We have a little right? chromatogram on it. All right, 327 test. So we're, hopefully, I think I've got a few minutes maybe to do a few of these up front here. So yeah, we've got about 15 minutes at least. Okay. I'm going to take a while. Okay, um, so what I did was, um, I don't use this test because I have a GC, okay? But with Rick from B, what's his? B100 Supply. Thank you, B100 Supply. So he's like Graydon East. Yeah. Do you guys have a line? Do you guys like, you know, sit where the line is? We've noticed there is a line on our map before we block customers, but no. Well, anyway, so exactly. is it fair to say, because you guys, you guys talk all the time, right? You're, they're, they're, it's like the, the, the wicked witch of the east and the wicked witch of the west or something. But basically, <laughs> he's Graydon's counterpart on the east coast. He's in Georgia now, isn't he? He's in Alabama. 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 We have more Alabama. Alabama. Right. Okay. So, like I said, did this work? Um, one, because he inspired me to do it, so we, we conspired together. Two, because I thought that for folks like you then, who could actually look at the 327 and say, what is its validity or not? Does it have validity? There would be some basis. Again, this is not peer reviewed. It's Bob and Rick reviewed. Uh, and it's now going to be you guys reviewed. Uh, this is why I did this. And a very nice write-up of this was done, thank you, Frankie, in Be Smarter magazine. Biodiesel Smarter. Yes. Biodiesel Smarter. So again, shameless plug for that. Um, but, um, what's thank you? What's what's cool about that is that it's again people who it's this group that conspires and then publishes it, not for fame and glory or you know any of that thing, but for other people to learn from, it, right? That's why you did what you did. Um, so what we're looking at here is that 0.09 fuel. This was the waste metal oil based stuff, um, and I've got that sample here. Put it in the test tube. These pictures don't really quite do justice, so that's why I brought some. And uh, thanks, Paul, for the ethanol again. It was clear. Squirted the, the, the one MLN. And so these are centrifuge tubes. They're plastic. I've got some over here. They graduated all the way to the bottom. They hold, what, 15 mLs, I think? So 
I can't fit a 327 in there, but I can fit a 19, and because they're graduated all the way down the cone, okay, so this is one and a half mLs, one is about here, a half is about here, okay? So on 10, a half of an mL is half a percent? No, no, 5 percent. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the bottom line is, if you see any precipitate, it's real easy. We'll see that here in a minute. Um, this one was, again, expect this was Illinois State sample. And so it clouded, but no droplets of precipitate. And on the GC, they came in at 0.213. So this is just under spec, right? This is somewhat cloudy. Somewhat cloudy, no precipitate, OK? And it's 0.92, OK? So this line doesn't mean anything. It's actually that light being being refracted through there. But this is what, if you can see, if we're looking at these drops and this this stuff, when this settled out, oh, there's point, 1.82. Okay, it's pretty easy to see. Okay, these are triglycerides. Uh huh. You know, it's a great question. I think what it so it could. I don't know. Is is the short answer? Okay, could it be water. Could be. It, what it isn't is bound glycerin. Okay, so I don't know. So um, all the bound glycerin came out over there and the bottom. Yeah. So what's happening is the reason I say it's not bound glycerin is there's very little bound glycerin here. Okay, and what it is is so it's not triglycerides. It's really where I should say that, right? Um, and so the field is spec. And so in reading what Andrew Morris has done, and he's done a lot of this, and other folks are chewing on it with him and doing tests and posting their results in the info pop forum, um, you know, the temperature this test is done at um, can make a difference. The uh, washed or dried fuel can make a difference. So you should do it with dry fuel, um, because why not? Um, then you're, you're reducing those variables. Um, I suspect that, again, this was done with enzymes, so I don't know what's in there. I'm looking at John over here. Huh? You want to go on that? Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, so basically, a lot of critters, you know, uh, microbes can't take in the triglycerides because they're too big. And so they excrete lipases, which don't have to be powered by anything. They can actually acquire a water oil lipase. They can crack off the glycerol and make free fatty acids. That's what free fatty acids typically do. Well, there's other ways, too, but the biological degradation happens. Then they can bring in the free fatty acids and chew those up. So people have used isolated lipases as an enzymatic way in the presence of ethanol to get names. You add ethanol or methanol. You can actually get names from these enzymes. So this could be fatty acids. Um, if you did in the presence of, uh, it could be, but if you did in the presence of ethanol and methanol, there should be fatty acid and ethanol esters. Right? It could be just fatty acids. So and again, as we looked at the chromatogram, there was nothing terribly obvious on there, like, oh my god, what's that big thing? Um, but you know, because this biodiesel was made in, in what I'm going to call an unconventional way, or at least unconventional to me, don't know what <laughs> um, Okay, look at that one. All right. Let me just get past that for just a sec. These are the samples I have down here. So actually, what I, what I did was, um, so the Rocky Mountain Biodiesel Waste Vegetable Oil one, I call it my Magellan sample because once I've got a full ASTM spec on that, I've had this deal since April of it's going to Bob Smithsonian. <laughs> um, it's a check sample, okay? Um, and so this is what the GC said and what its total was. This is a poultry fat sample I have here. This is made from 100% poultry, primarily chicken, some turkey. Um, and again, here's it's bound, it's free, and it's inspect. So that's why I'm saying pass. This is pass fail on the GC. Um, this is made by Imperial Western Products out of California. This particular fuel was 50% walnut feedstock. Anybody in here run that fuel? It's a nice looking fuel. Um, uh, there's been some discussions about their feedstock being a, what do you call it, a drying oil? What is that? It's like linseed oil? Yeah, not cutting oil. It's like, I want to say it's a drying oil. And it has some properties to it, right? Yes. Okay. So, again, jury's out, you know, because those things take time, but. The reason I say nice fuel is, from a GC standpoint, conversion standpoint, from a soap measurement I did on this, you know, us biodiesel people will go get samples from other people and test them <coughs> to benchmark ourselves. Uh, they made nice fuel. So it was half walnut, one quarter waste vegetable oil, or used fryer oil. 
and poultry fat. Uh, almost like a Waldorf salad, isn't it? Uh, uh, and so, uh, this is hemp fuel, and Terry, I don't know if you want to share, if it's appropriate to share, because I don't know who made that fuel. It was from the Pell Energy, so Tide Square Energy. Okay. And when I gave it to you, it was at least six years old, sitting in a jug in my face. Nice. <laughs> so it's green, and you'll see yes, it's green. Right. And it's apparently not dyed, right? We weren't that sure. Is, when that we is correct. I have made it since then with virgin oil that I import through Kinex, and it does also turn that shape. Nice. So we can look at that. I've got that sample down here, and we'll squirt it to two. So this one came in. I mean, it was pretty nice, right? It's really close to spec. And again, I don't know what he did. And I don't know either. I'm sorry, the gentleman's name or maybe the guy? Right, so I've heard the name, so I'm going to need to go look him up. Yeah. Right. Cool stuff, um, but a fail on the GC. Um, John Bush, I'm not sure which palm oil I have from you. So one of yours that you did a three three step base reaction? Yeah, what, the, um, that was from a project I did in uh, in Columbia. And the, I think the first sample was as it was when I brought it back from Columbia, and the second sample was some that I had re-reacted a couple of times because so it, it sat around for a while, so I took some and re-reacted it and then brought it in. So when, when I first met John, um, we talked to the found, uh, we decided to get together up and birth it. He brought up tra uh, transesterified bacon fat, he brought up transesterified palm, he brought up transesterified, he brought some soy. What else did you have? Uh, you know, mine had some neem oil too. Oh, you did have some neem oil. Yeah, that came from <coughs> CU. Like somebody from Africa sent it to them and was like, "Can you test this and make bodies out of it?" So we we're like, "Sure." Um, I but I don't know. I, I don't know if it ever went anywhere. But I, I've transesterified some shea oil. Uh, my friend Wally down here up front uh, is from Nigeria. He's got uh, he does a, a business where he brings in shea nut and trans, uh, uh, creates uh, skin products, hand products, like his grandmother used to. Uh, it's a natural process. Water, no, no hexane, right? Yeah. So he lives in Texas. Yes, Lars? You've done it in Detroit. Not yet, but I'll comment on that in a sec. So while he brings this in, he goes, we met at a show in Plano, I don't know, a month or so ago. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know, could you try this, Bob? And I went, sure. <laughs> sure. Um, it's solid, man. And, and the fuel, and I haven't been able to run it on our, on our GC yet, um, uh, because our GC is having one of those off the table moments. Um, and uh, what I'm going to, obviously. And, and, uh, so anyway, so, so we're going to find out with the 327 test. I just don't remember, John, because you had both those in-house. Which one? Because when people bring me samples, mm. or, or if I test it, I go, you know, you've got to leave me some, right? And so thanks, Terry. Thanks, John. I've got all these. And I've showed those samples lots and lots of times now. Um, and the last one that I've got here is the fuel mice. So we are going to, let me run through this slide, and then we'll turn on the lights. And Sort of to wrap up the presentation piece, lab lessons learned, okay? And there's tons more. Um, talk to Rachel, because she's run a lot more tests. Talk to me too, but just stuff we've learned. Leave your cell phone outside of them, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so the ones I put on the slide whenever I did this, this was February, keep a lab notebook of all sample runs and machine events. So your machine falls off the table, I mean literally, not, not literally, or literally, write it in, your lab book. Change the column, write it in. <coughs> because you're going to go back and go, God, this happened to me once. This happened to me. When Hepta was table, what did I do? All oh, right, I tweaked the inlet. Again, back to the example with the, the, the um, uh, networking. If we knew what the last thing we tweaked or what the couple things that had to come together to make it work, wouldn't it be nice to have written that down? Because a lot of times you don't know. But keep a lab book. It's worth writing stuff down. Just a simple thing you buy from the, you know, the, the school supply store. Um, Develop a routine for sample prep on anything you do. That's just GC stuff. And do it the same way. So if you run the 327 test, do it the same way every time. Every time. Same type of temperature. Don't do it out in the sun one day and in your cold basement the next day. Do it the same place, same way, same equipment. Minimize variables. Uh, spot, stock spare stuff. Because, um, you know, especially if you're a commercial producer, just when you need to test something because the tank is waiting and then you can't get the little stopper out of your, your centrifuge file. Um, didn't really happen, but it could have. I <laughs> See? <laughs> Stay focused when in the lab. Um, it's just really important because, you know, I've started doing sample prep and I'm putting in the stuff into the fives. I'm running five. I put in the, the MSDFA. I start with the 10 one. I go, what's that noise? Is that steep screen? 
dreaming because he was singing with the music, or did he just, you know, switch leak in the, in the wash tank, right? Steve was kind of work with him at birthday. And then I go, get back to it. And I see it was Steve singing. He really liked uh, Metallica and stuff like that. And anyway, so it was Steve. And I go back to him and say, damn, did I already put it in this one or not? And you know when you got to do that? You got to start over. I mean, you know, you just, you have to, if you have good lab at all. Um, learn to analyze chromatic curves visually. You know, I think you guys are up the learning curve now. Perform maintenance and repair tasks in-house. And this goes for your Harbor Freight pumps. This goes for the little uh, prime D-League on, on trash pumps, right? The stuff we learn from out in the field, right? Learn how to do that, have those pieces around. Because it's expensive, not just in, if, if it's a GC, it's $600 for a four-hour call, okay? But if you're out, you know, doing what Steve does, and your pump doesn't prime, and you waited for 30 minutes to get in there while all the other delivery trucks came in and out, you know, you're going to wish you had an extra plug, right? Something like that. Um, keep you out on cluttered and clean. Uh, ensure that all your chemicals are labeled and stored properly. You know, when you have kids or don't have kids, some of us act like kids, mark stuff. The fire guys, if they come through, they love this. Okay, they love to see things marked. Um, have your fuel tested by a third-party lab. Participate in a cross-check program with your friends. And uh, if your friends are in the ASTM, well, they'll cost you. Um, and there's that. So let's go. Whoopsie. Can we turn on the lights, please? And let's get back to this. If we could go back to, could you, go, could you, while I get this stuff out, go back to the slide that had the, yeah, this is an apple, <laughs> had the uh, results. And I know that, so if you guys want, I don't know, want to, like try to come see some of this, I'll set them out here. But, uh, uh, almost the last one, it's got the, the matrix of the, these samples and whose PC is this compact? Okay, here's, the only reason I'm bringing it up is it's fine to be there, but if any of this stuff spills, it's not my fault. No, no, it's not my fault. Uh, these came from Corning, and we buy them in bulk. Um, 